excited to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'm presenting about the latest in DeFi, uh, what I think is a booming and better uh, financial system. I'm Camila Russo. I'm the founder of The Defiant, uh, one of the leading financial uh, information platforms uh, focusing on Web3. I'm also the author of The Infinite Machine, uh, the first book on the history of Ethereum, and previously I was a Bloomberg News uh, journalist for eight years. All right. Um, so as Fabian really uh, e explained very well um, what DeFi is about, it's, I agree, it's extremely exciting. Um, decentralized finance is rebuilding the financial system as we know it uh, before our very eyes. Um, I, I kind of saw this happening emerging from Ethereum, Ethereum hackathons and conferences when I was researching for the Infinite Machine back in 2018. Um, and it was really astounding to see how developers were rebuilding each key piece, each kind of building block of finance right on top of public blockchains. Um, and what started to come out of that effort was a truly open and global financial system that doesn't rely on any third parties, just as its underlying uh, technology, the blockchain, doesn't rely on any third parties. Um, I think what we're witnessing here is a new layer on top of the internet. So the internet is made up of different protocols. Um, right now, developers um, and entrepreneurs are building a value layer, the, the value protocol layer, on top of all the, the, the other uh, stack, the tech stack that makes up the current internet. So what's being uh, done right now is finance, money, value is being made native to the web. Um, the current financial system, what it does is there is kind of finance on, on one hand, uh, very separate from the internet, from the way we usually communicate, and then there's the web, this kind of global, seamless um, information network. Um, now, thanks to blockchain and crypto, those two can work together. And this is why we're seeing this explosion um, in, in innovation, because you're combining two very powerful forces, the internet and finance. And so uh, developers started building, uh, as I mentioned, all the um, basic kind of building blocks of finance right on top of public blockchains like Ethereum. Um, and I'll give you some examples. A uh, very important one, uh, Crypto hackers are building new forms of money. So there are th basically three different uh, types of stablecoins. Uh, there's fiat-backed stablecoins, there's crypto-backed, and there's algorithmic stablecoins. Fiat-backed means that there is actual fiat money, um, as uh, you know, crypto people like to call central bank issued money, um, stored in banks, and that's backing stablecoins such as USDC. Then there is crypto-backed stablecoins, such as DAI, uh, that's mostly backed by Ether and also other stablecoins. Um, so that's a lot more native to, to DeFi. Uh, with stablecoins like DAI, you kind of don't even need fiat currencies. Um, initially, DAI had just was only backed by ETH, so you could have this completely parallel money that didn't require um, any, any central banks or any financial institutions at all. Um, now DAI is backed by USDC, so you could argue it's become a little bit more centralized. Um, and then there's algorithmic stablecoins. And in this case, Terra, uh, UST uh, of the Terra ecosystem is completely decentralized. It doesn't require any, any sort of fiat uh, currency or any uh, fiat-backed stablecoins. It is backed 
purely by, um, by Luna, by the, the, the token of the Terra ecosystem. And it relies on this algorithm uh, that keeps the peg to the US dollar. Um, second important kind of building block of DeFi is lending and borrowing. So you have dozens by, by now, I think, of uh, protocols uh, which, you know, as, as we saw before, really only rely on blockchains and smart contracts to work. They, they're automated. Um, things like Aave, Compound, uh, Liquidy, they allow users to uh, deposit value directly on smart contracts without asking anyone for permission and start gaining interest directly to their, to their address, block by block. Um, and the other side of this uh, is borrower, borrowers. So borrowers can uh, deposit collateral and take out a loan uh, in exchange. Again, without any sort of intermediary, just a, a non-custodial blockchain address, speaking to a smart contract and executing these, uh, these transactions. Um, there are uh, decentralized exchanges, things like uh, Uniswap, Curve, SushiSwap, um, which by that kind of um, curve, that, uh, that um, mechanism uh, that you saw, that X, X and, and Y equals uh, uh, K, I think, um, you really, again, don't need any sort of centralized order book. You don't need any financial intermediary. Um, there, you're trading against liquidity pools stored in smart contracts. Um, and then there are dozens of other uh, use cases. Uh, as I said, the financial system is being rebuilt use case by use case on top of open blockchains, really creating a parallel financial system. Um, and this already has millions of users billions of value is being logged and transacted. This is real, like this is happening, it's not going anywhere. Um, so other use cases that we already see are uh, brokerages, asset management, derivatives, market makers, indices, insurance, auctions, and prediction markets. So even with all these uh, use cases, um, DeFi is still tiny, I, I, as I mentioned, it, it only really started to happen a couple of years ago. Um, but in, in that uh, short time, in two years, it's expanded by 200 times, um, holding about 170 uh, billion in value in, in smart contracts. But it's still only 10% uh, if you put the market capitalization of all the DeFi tokens together, it's just 10% of crypto. And we know that crypto is also a fraction of traditional finance. So it's still kind of a drop in the bucket, which, you know, another way to see it is there's a lot more room for it to grow. Um, right now, speculation is definitely uh, the biggest use case. I think it's, it's so early and there's a lot of risk. So right now, people kind of really using these protocols are whales, uh, you know, traders, uh, hedge funds, uh, crypto funds, um, using these protocols to make money. Uh, but I, I believe that there's potential here for true financial inclusion, um, thanks to, you know, how open these, uh, the, these systems are. They, are. they are made to lower the barriers of entry and provide financial services globally to anyone who's, who really, who has an internet connection. Um, so, you know, I think this is w what's important um, and, you know, why people are, are, are excited uh, about this. Um, we're seeing examples of how DeFi can be life-changing right now. Uh, in, in the past couple of weeks, uh, Ukraine has been able to raise over $100 million in crypto donations. All they did was post a, a tweet from their official account uh, with a few blockchain addresses, Bitcoin, ETH, and a few other cryptocurrencies, and just started taking uh, donations and contributions globally. And this, you know, this meant that anyone could easily, in, in, in seconds, 
donate to Ukraine without having to go through any third party, any, you know, uh, in, any, any institution, just directly into Ukraine's coffers to help uh, with, with, their, uh, with their effort. Um, it's just a better global, more efficient system, which allows uh, this to happen. Um, and, you know, the consequence is that people for the first time can actually own their assets no matter what. If your bank gets destroyed or if your bank decides to not let you withdraw your, your assets, you can just take everything with you for the first time. Refugees are able to take everything with them just by having a seed phrase of their crypto account. Um, my family had to run away from, from Europe into Latin America uh, in, in the Second World War, and they lost everything. Um, and now, you know, if, if that, that's happening today, and refugees don't need to do that anymore. They can take all their assets with them for the, for the first time. Um, so, okay, we, we discussed kind of the basic building blocks that, uh, that, kind of, that are already emerging in, in DeFi. Um, but this presentation was about the latest in DeFi. So here are kind of some of the really kind of bleeding edge, uh, uh, cutting edge um, use cases that are emerging thanks to composability uh, and are creating things that really can't be done in traditional finance. So an example is self-paying collateralized loans. Um, there's this protocol called Abracadabra, which you take out a loan, you deposit collateral, Abracadabra, because of this money Lego quality, plugs into another protocol called Yearn and starts earning interest on that collateral, and that is automatically paying back the loans of people who, you know, of, of borrowers. Um, flash loans. Uh, this is a super exciting use case. It uh, allows, again, borrowers to, uh, without any collateral, without having any capital, take out as much money as they want from these lending protocols, Aave, Compound, as long as they can return it in the same transaction. So they can go take out I don't know, $100 million, uh, use it to leverage trade on another protocol, make a lot of money, and then pay it back. Um, this is obviously kind of super sophisticated, and you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do this, but uh, you, know, uh, you can see how uh, this can be automated, and, and, um, and, and it can open up uh, a lot of possibilities for, for people who don't have up from upfront capital uh, to do this, because as long as you return the money on the same transaction, you can borrow as much money as you want. Um, and then another uh, innovative use case is liquid staking. Uh, this is um, s uh, something that's being done with proof of stake networks, uh, such as Ethereum 2.0. You know how Ethereum is moving from proof of work to proof of stake, and there's other blockchains that are using proof of stake, like Cosmos and Polkadot. Um, and what liquid staking allows is that you can stake your crypto, so you, you can participate in securing these blockchain networks, um, but you, you can earn a, a, a representation of your stake in return. So you stake, on uh, Lido is, is one of the uh, protocols uh, projects doing this. You can stake ETH on ETH2 uh, and, and get a token that represents your stake. And then with that token, you can sell it, you can get, gain instant liquidity, um, uh, even though your, your, your actual Ethereum is kind of locked up on the Ethereum network. So, these kinds of derivatives that are very easy to create uh, with DeFi uh, allow for a lot of uh, capital efficiency that's, that would be very hard to do in, in traditional finance. Um, and then there's uh, many other kind of cutting edge uh, use cases. 
Um, there's protocol-owned liquidity, that's this kind of DeFi 2.0 wave, uh, decentralized identity, interestless collateralized loans, um, which uh, Robert can, can talk uh, about now, NFT-backed loans, uh, cross-chain transactions, and you know, it, it's really kind of a really booming sector thanks to this uh, openness and uh, composability. Um, and finally, so yeah, we're here uh, to see the intersection of DeFi and CBDCs. So what role does uh, CBDCs play? Um, and yeah, similar to Fabian, um, I, I don't think DeFi needs uh, CBDCs. Uh, as I mentioned, DeFi has its own currencies. Um, NFTs are priced in ETH. Uh, lending and borrowing has many different stable coins. Um, but uh, I think CBDCs can uh, have an advantage. Uh, th there can be an advantage in including uh, CBDCs. Um, to start, uh, they can be an, an alternative uh, to other stable coins. For example, the, the fiat backed centra centralized stable coins that I mentioned before, like USDC. Um, instead of trusting Circle, uh, the company, uh, Circle and Coinbase, the companies behind USDC, maybe, you know, it's just better to have uh, USD directly from, from the Fed that plugs into DeFi. Um, so I think that's a really interesting use case. I also think there's an opportunity for uh, central banks to, to help solve one of the m biggest like missing pieces in DeFi, which is decentralized identity. If central banks can um, help provide this piece with, with some sort of uh, public, verifiable government digital identity that can plug into DeFi, that would open uh, the space for tons of use cases that aren't possible right now. Um, but to do this, uh, I think CBDCs uh, and central banks need to come, you know, play in DeFi's playground. They need to be uh, decentralized. They need to be issued on public blockchains. They can't be on a centralized ledger. Um, and they have to be um, censorship resistant and allow for self-custody. If that's not the case, then there's simply no way DeFi and CBDCs can talk to each other. And like I said, I think there, there would be uh, advantages uh, if this were to happen. But that's just my opinion. So uh, let's hear from our panelists now. We're having a, a, a discussion. Unless like somebody has a presentation? No. All right. OK. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Such a pleasure to have, the, uh, have a chance to chat with you all. Um, would be great if we can start with uh, introductions. Um, uh, make, uh, do you want to start, and then we can, we can go? Sure, I'm Michael Egorov, the founder of uh, Curve Finance, which is a decentralized exchange and automatic market maker. So my name is Wenqian Huang, I'm an economist from the BIS. I'm Robert Lauko, I'm the founder and CEO of Liquidity, which is an interest-free lending protocol and stablecoin system. Uh, my name is Roger Wattenhofer, I'm a professor at ETH Zurich. Great, um, okay, so as we saw that uh, it's important to set kind of the, the ground rules <laughs> or, or where we want to be on the same page, um, let's, let's agree on what everyone understands that DeFi is. Um, and, and again, we can, we can start with Michael and then go down. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I pretty much uh, agree, agree with what uh, Fabian said in, in the previous talks. Um, but for me, what's most important in DeFi is the non-custodial part of it. So it's uh, basically you, you don't trust anyone with, uh, with your money and uh, you don't even trust the vendor who made uh, the, the financial service. So for me, I think uh, DeFi really, they are just, uh, you know, uh, automated and composable, uh, automated uh, 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 smart contracts that can compose with each other. So uh, essentially, they are programs. Um, and a key feature for me is really the open access that uh, DeFi uh, projects try to provide. And then also, you know, this uh, interoperability interoperability between DeFi projects. Um, and also final feature of DeFi, I think, is about the um, global reach. So basically, as the Camila said, that uh, you know, uh, it's open to all usage of uh, all users on internet. So I think, uh, yeah, DeFi for me is sort of uh, uh, by nature uh, borderless. Um, yeah, I will pass on. Yeah, I think I agree with pretty much everything which has already been said, but I would like to emphasize one feature of DeFi, which is immutability and autonomy. Like with, in DeFi, you can build systems that run on their own based on their like preset rules. So it's just everything can be like laid out in advance and then the system just performs those actions that has been like kind of enshrined in the code. And I think this is like something that hasn't been possible before in traditional finance. I also agree with most that was said. I personally, I think DeFi could have a role in CBDCs, actually. So when you turn the thing around and it's not decentralized anymore, I could see that this could happen. Maybe then the name DeFi is a bit wrong, but uh, apart from that, uh, I would be fine with it. And since everybody mentioned something which they like very much about it, I also do that. Uh, so for me, it's really the programmability of uh, of these contracts, and I'll probably disagree with uh, Thomas Jordan here who said maybe you cannot express everything. I think everything that can be expressed mathematically can also be done. And if you say finance is more than just expressing everything, it's also about feelings and whatnot, then maybe. But, uh, you know, may maybe we should have strict rules in finance and then you can express it in, t in, in FinTech or in DeFi. Um, so you made me think of, of, a, of a question uh, you said everyone said something they like about DeFi. I'd love to hear what you guys maybe don't like about DeFi. So on that, maybe I can start yeah. since I'm from the BIS. <laughs> 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 but jokes aside, I, I, I think DeFi is a cool idea. However, I think there are some uh, serious issues that uh, that can prevent this benefit from being realized. Uh, one major issue is mar market integrity. Um, just share some personal experience when I was learning uh, this the smart contract language, Solidity and Viper. I just found tons of misinformation on the internet, right? And then later on, when I dig deeper, there are just a lot of scams. I totally agree with this the non custodial feature of DeFi, but I'm not very sure whether I can own my asset on the chain safely because that just subject to so many hacks, so many potential scams. So right now, actually, I stopped doing my DeFi transactions because I just find there are so many uh, uh, fraud and scams. And from my point of view, I think regulation is urgently needed uh, to safeguard uh, consumers and investors, especially uh, as the Camila said, you know, DeFi has the yeah gained in scale, and you know, people put on their uh, wealth into into DeFi, into the blockchain. And I think, you know, regulations would be very, very much welcome to help them to protect their assets from, uh, from uh, being stolen from the, from the um, scams and fraud. Um, and also, you know, I think like uh, the second challenge would be more on the technology side. And uh, I know there are a lot of experts in the, in the audience and also in the panels. So I would very much love to hear about their opinion on uh, scalability and uh, tokenization of real assets. Mm because I think for DeFi to be really meaningful, uh, we need to have more uh, use cases uh, for the financial system and for the real economy in general. 
Uh, and then my last concern is that uh, you know, if all these issues could be uh, resolved and DeFi attain some syst uh, systemic role in the financial markets, then we will have financial stability issues. So some of them, they are very similar to what we have been seeing uh, in traditional finance. For instance, like uh, procyclicality due to the reliance of collaterals. So basically, currently, all the DeFi landings, they are collateralized landing, right? So uh, for that front, I think we definitely need some regulation on how to mitigate uh, procyclicality. And then there are also some novel risk with DeFi. I mean, for instance, like Camila just mentioned, there are these flash loans where, you know, arbitrageurs, they can borrow and uh, do the arbitrage trade and repay the loan all at the same time. So this indeed is a very new financial instrument that has not yet been seen in uh, traditional finance. However, I mean, these fresh loans also bring a lot of problems to DeFi projects, right? So we know about the fresh loan attacks, which could be, you know, um, essentially stole, uh, steal all the money from the, from the liquidity pools because of some bug risk in the, in the DeFi projects. So I feel like, you know, in this field, there are a lot of things happening, a lot of exciting features. However, to really make these features beneficial to the financial market and to the, uh, to the general public, we really need to have, uh, have a better look about uh, which ones are true, genuine innovations and which ones are more about, you know, uh, either the decentralized theater, as Fabian just said, or, you know, some just pure uh, uh, Ponzi schemes. So I would very much like to hear from the others, different perspective. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it actually was a very, uh, very good uh, summary, especially from a um, kind of uh, BIS perspective. <laughs> 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 um, and, and yeah, I actually pretty much agree with uh, uh, with the problems which you uh, which you enlisted but I probably mostly disagree that the solution is uh, regulations apart from maybe uh, apart from maybe scams in uh, in DeFi I think uh, if uh, there was a regulation to ban uh, Google ads that would solve most of the scams <laughs> <laughs> um, but really um, things like um, well, like financial stability, for example. I think that could be addressed algorithmically. It's just, uh, it actually takes time to do all the, all the research, uh, but I think this, uh, things like this can be uh, pre-programmed. Uh, so I, I don't think that like imposing regulations on something which cannot be in enforced really, really would solve the problem. Um, well, really, DeFi is something which ha which hasn't been seen before. It's uh, like the first time uh, in history you are able to uh, to do something without trusting a counterparty. And uh, regulations are really designed to um, to kind of hold the counterparty accountable. So if there is no counterparty, then maybe. You need um, you need basically the algorithm to to be able to do the correct thing, and um, I think in the past uh, we probably took this point of view that counterparty maybe doesn't know uh, in advance uh, how everything should work. So maybe apart from uh, apart from not wrongdoing, counterparty can be. Uh, can kind of steer the system to uh, to operate in the right way, and um, I think now if w when we are having the ability to not have a counterparty, maybe it's better to uh, to kind of pre-program things. Maybe you don't know all things in in advance, but um, you know right now it's an experimentation phase, so we are looking at what's happening and iterate on the algorithms and maybe address uh, some of the issues uh, you mentioned. Maybe there is also another like layer to this discussion. I mean, there is the protocol and there is regulation and the government and how you would want to regulate it, but there is also like this interface to the user. Like, if DeFi really aims to become like the building block of the future financial system, it has to be accessible to a broad public, like ideally to the majority of uh, like the world's population. And, and currently, what, what we, we see is that it's only accessible like practically to a very small 
kind of selection. I mean, it's, it's a practical issue. It's not that it's, I mean, it's permissionless. It's built in a way that it should be accessible, but there are just usability issues. I mean, it's complicated to use by many non-technical people. It's hard to explain because this concept of decentralization is, I think, something which is maybe not as intuitively like easy to grasp for many people, unfortunately. So I think there is also kind of on like how we as protocol developers kind of market and present the UI to the end user. I think that's also something where I think a lot of, there's a lot of room for improvement to be done. And I think, yeah, that's also an aspect that shouldn't be neglected if we really want to change uh, like the system. Roger, what do you think? Do you think DeFi can be regulated? I'm not the person to talk about regulation very much. Uh, I would just like to add an example first uh, for, a, for a possible risk. So this is what Fabian Scher mentioned. He said there's a transparency that everybody can see all the transactions. What he didn't say is that transactions are usually visible earlier before they are in the blockchain. They're visible to everybody, maybe 10 seconds earlier. So what happens now is that people see these transactions and they basically front and back run the transactions. They make sandwich attacks and they get money out of it. You can use composability, that way it's completely risk-free. You just package the transaction you want to attack with two transactions of yourself, front and back, and you make risk-free money. So this is a problem of DeFi, I would say. But it's even worse because there are now companies, uh, one is called Flashbots, for instance, they're calling themselves the good guys. <laughs> what they do is they offer a service. So you don't send the transaction to the blockchain anymore, you send it to them. They will send it to the blockchain for you. You don't have to pay anything for that, but they will sandwich your attack themselves. So you kind of, they promise that they're the only ones who sandwich your, your transaction and you know, you're gonna pay that way. So maybe these things also happen in traditional finance, but uh, nobody knows really, and we know a little bit, but uh, it's not as open as in the, in the DeFi world. So you can see these things in the DeFi world back and forth everywhere, and that's in some sense a risk for DeFi. Yeah, but at least as you said, it's all transparent, so it's clear uh, how to counteract these uh, sandwich attacks, and this is happening actually. Yes. Um, but I think that there is a problem with transparency um, just in, in a way that like how, how much people are informed about the protocols, especially this uh, issue of uh, decentralization theater. Um, because like not, not all DeFi projects are really non-custodial, right? And when you deal with a, well, I don't know, like uh, pr probably unlike most people here, I uh, most, uh, Mostly, um, mostly keep money in DeFi and do most transactions in DeFi rather than in traditional finance. Uh, but you know, not all DeFi is is that trustless. You sometimes, sometimes you have projects where you uh, actually have the possibility of the team to change the code, change the rules, and uh, in the worst case, take your assets. And really, that one is not what you would really call DeFi, it's really closer to traditional financial institutions. And that's where kind of regulations are needed. But also, like even if, uh, like, like how, how would you know that uh, one project is fully decentralized and the other is not? So this uh, information transparency, informing the users uh, wh what the risks are is I think a really, really important. And like not even with enforcing, just the information. Uh, it's um, like just conveying this information to, to all users is something which needs to be done, I think. I mean, what you didn't say is that many smart contracts, in fact, have these backdoors. There are studies about this, and uh, not the majority of them, but a large fraction of them have backdoors. And this makes it very insecure, as you say, right? Because some, you know, you put money in a smart contract and then somebody calls the back door and changes basically some of the code. Right. That should not be happening, but uh, this is Exactly. Happening. If <laughs> I may chime in also, you know, what uh, Roger mentioned about this the sandwich attack, they very much depend on, you know, the mining powers, right? So they even coined the term miner extractable value. That means that uh, for the large miners, they 
can have this mining power, they, have, they can have the execution advantage over the others so that they can uh, do this sandwich attack and uh, grab the profit from it. So I think like, you know, when we really talk about uh, decentralization, there are several layers. I agree with uh, Fabian's the, uh, structure that, you know, for the protocol layer, it's very much decentralized. For instance, like Curve, I think they decentralize the uh, liquidity provisions. But then when it gets to the blockchain layer, the, the record keeping layer, they are only technical decentralized, right? So that's what Thomas said about, you know, technically uh, blockchain technologies enable decentralization. However, because in the real business life, we are, we are having contracts dynamically. So we need to frequently renegotiate the contracts, redesign the contracts. So in that sense, actually we need some centralized governance behind these blockchains. And as we can see, you know, in the, in the proof of work, we have large concentration in the mining pools. In proof of stake, uh, Hume has a nice paper shows that, you know, uh, likely, you know, val validators, they will need to have incentives. And uh, in the end, economy of scale will make them oligopoly markets, right? So we see all this concentration in decision-making power behind this technology. And I think it's very important that we also mention this layer. So not only the technological layers, but also the governance layer, how centralized or how decentralized the governance layer is for most of the DeFi applications, right? So in, in essence, you know, when we talk about DeFi, I think we are more of talking about the possibility of open access. But for the decentralization part, I feel like we are still have a long way to go. So just one example on, on uh, I think, what we can all agree uh, from both sides. Uh, I think Bitcoin is sort of the most decentralized protocol uh, so far. Um, but yet, you know, change of the Bitcoin protocol takes years, right? So it's not easy to reach decentralized consensus. And in real business life, can you imagine that your money would be managed by a protocol that would take years to, uh, to, be, to be modified, to fit into the current trend, to fit into the current development of the business world? Well, I guess I would not, but I do understand this is a, ma a menu of options and people have different uh, preferences. Yeah, that's an important point. I mean, you raise, I mean, sometimes more friction can be a good thing when it comes to governance. Because, yeah, as you say, I mean, if people can change the system, like, while the game is running, I mean, that leads to, like, unpredictable outcomes. So, I mean, there is also another, like, more radical approach to this where you don't need a governance because there is nothing to govern. And that's basically, like, what our, or we kind of opted for by kind of creating a system that's completely immutable. I mean, it's really radical because, I mean, it's really hard to foresee all the future challenges and, and changes, but still, I mean, it's something that has been running now for a year and it turned out to work more or less as we planned, but it's really there set in stone forever. I mean, there is nobody who can mess with it. There is no kind of concentration of power in the hands of a few because, yeah, they cannot do anything. Of course, it depends on the base layer, like the Ethereum network, but I mean, that's like another kind of question. So, yeah, I want to hear your opinion, like what would you think, yeah, would this, like what other challenges this introduces or solves? Yeah. I guess you probably one thing you didn't mention, but I think that's kind of implicit. If you set uh, the system in stone like this, then how would the upgrade look like? Because it's not impossible to upgrade this system. You just make a brand new system, and if people want to use the brand new one, they use the brand new one. So uh, this is how the upgrade happens. You don't change uh, the code which holds people's money. You just uh, introduce a new one, and uh, it just competes with your old code. So and who knows, maybe the new system was not a good idea, then the money will be will live in the old one. Definitely, I agree with that. I mean, that is what we have been seeing with uh, Bitcoin's uh, upgrade, right? So there are many attempts, many proposals, some of them fail, others, uh, well, very, very few succeeded because it's very difficult to achieve decentralized consensus. And I think it's, it's a noble uh, thought, you know, as you said, that uh, we are building something that uh, that is, you know, uh, that can spare governance. 
Um, I think I think totally. I think maybe that is the use case for for uh, DLT. Uh, however, you know when we get into the financial market, uh, for instance, like in HFT uh, mediated uh, markets, we are talking about millisecond of changes, right? So we are talking about you know like uh, how the how the how the different traders they can interact with each other in a really high frequency. And for that kind of technology, for that kind of uh, applications, I'm just wondering. Maybe Maybe you know some centralization could help. I'm not saying that you know the the functional layer of uh, decentralization is not important. On the contrary, I think that is very very innovative, and I think that can probably help you know uh, upgrade the plumbing behind the financial system a lot. You know, re uh, reduce the reconciliation uh, cost in the back offices of banks. You know, basically replace some of the inefficient operations from banks. Uh, with with DeFi, I think that is a very very promising uh, feature. I'm just thinking, you know, being more provocative about, you know, what essentially are the added values of DeFi yeah, well, projects I, I in that, financial markets. Yeah, right? well, one thing is the the most important is that there is no counterparty, so you don't have to trust anyone. You don't uh, you don't have to trust someone that your money will not be frozen, right? I I I, I I'd like to add something. Um, which I think might clarify, I think, which may be a, a misconception on, on how DeFi protocols work. Because one thing is the base layer, that's Bitcoin or Ethereum. And in the case of Bitcoin, yes, it takes a long time to make consensus changes. And that's by design, because it's, it's made to be kind of uh, very, like, the, the, like, very hard to to change and so it's people can can trust it and has become this kind of digital gold um, ethereum while more flexible also takes this kind of consensus between many many uh, parties to organize and, and come to to a change um, miners uh, uh, developers all like there's different layers that need to agree on on a change so that's that's the base and i think bitcoin and ethereum are probably the most decentralized um uh, blockchain networks out there but then there's the applications and protocols that are built on top of these networks and and these have a lot more flexibility to change than their base layer uh, like with with uh, curve liquidity uh, uniswap is I, I think you know maybe one of the, the most uh, decentralized uh, protocols running on Ethereum. And Uniswap uh, algorithm or you know, the decentralized exchange just runs, um, but they do have upgrades. So they, they, they're now under version three. And so you know, th there is kind of this ability of, of, of having this immutability, but also upgrading and and changing. Yeah, uh, but that's a brand new yeah. version, pretty yeah. much. Um, yeah. In fact, I think there is, at the moment, the amount of funds in Uniswap 3 is about the same as in Uniswap 2, and yeah. Uniswap 2 doesn't really want to, to yeah. die off because it's, uh, well, useful, very useful on its own. Yeah. And then the other the other uh, point I wanted to, to bring up is, you mentioned um, MEV, right? Uh, and and uh, you know this uh, sandwich attacks, um, and of course this also happens in traditional finance, right? In this case, you have companies like Flashbots, which lets anyone profit from this. Like I could go up to Flashbots and, and say like, hey, like I want to get some MEV revenue. That's that's only in for traditional finance only high frequency traders with billion dollar you know uh, balance sheets uh, can can go and do this um, so i think yes in defi we are seeing the same kind of uh, risk and attacks that we see in traditional finance but at least in DeFi, it's all out in the open, and anyone can take advantage of this. And so, linked to this, I'm, I'm wondering. You, you, we were talking about regulation because of like openness and, and transparency. That's that's in DeFi. Do you? What do you think about the ability of DeFi to self-regulate? Like how we've seen in all these hacks uh, so far. 
it's really been not with lawmakers or regulators, but it's been the actual DeFi and Web3 community, the ones that have caught hackers. Because there's just a very sophisticated chain analysis that because all of the transactions are public, allow you to go back and, and find uh, the you know, perpetrators of attacks, block their uh, exchanges, block their accounts, and so they're, they're unable to even you know, get away with it. Um, and in, in other cases, you know, protocols after, after the hacks, most cases, these projects have actually returned the, the money to their users. So I think they're, yes, like DeFi right now, because it's so early, it's in this kind of wild west uh, where it's not being uh, regulated. But it's not being regulated by traditional regulators. It, it actually is being regulated internally. Um, so I, I'd love to kind of hear your opinion on yeah, Absolutely on agree. It's actually, uh, that was my observation as well, that uh, I mean, most of these DeFi hacks, after some time passed, well, I mean, protocol probably, um, very often protocol compensates users, but also uh, pro the, the company who develops the protocol finds who the hacker was, negotiates with the hacker, hacker returns money. And this is exactly the traceability, the transparency of the blockchain, which uh, makes it possible. Uh, well, usually, when the hacker needs to, to get out, they would, uh, to, to real world, at some point they do, they do have to, uh, to interact with real world, so whether it's KYC or, or whatnot, they do kind of leave some traces to, to some counterparty there, because how else do you interact with real world? And uh, then you, you can find the trace on chain, or even if they use anonymization tools, it's, uh, Anonymization tools are actually hard to use. Like, I mean, so hard that Bitfinex uh, hackers, or, well, I don't know if they hacked, but they all laundered the funds from hack, at least. Uh, they tried everything possible to, to hide uh, to hide the traces of the money they had, and eventually they have been found, and uh, the, the money, well, most of the money were recovered, and I don't think traditional finance uh, has, um, has actually a track record comparable to, mm -hmm. to DeFi track record of recovery. Uh, a lot more obscure. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I guess, you know, uh, several points. First of all, on Uniswap v3 uh, and how decentralized is Uniswap, I have some uh, different opinions. Uh, well, I mean, one thing is about this, you know, tokenized Apple, tokenized Tesla that have been listed in Uniswap. And, uh, well, I mean, they have been listed there for a while until the admin team took down because concerns of SEC uh, pro uh, procurement, right? So, so there, there, are some, there, are, there are some, you know, uh, as, the, as what the Roger said, there are always these back doors that you are not really aware of, or you need very sophisticated technology to understand what is behind. So I find that is something, you know, less transparent, let's say, compared to uh, traditional finance or central centralized finance. Um, and then on the second thing about the trace, uh, I totally agree with you that, you know, uh, in DeFi worlds, you have all the transactions open. That brings advantage, but sometimes also risk, such as the sandwich uh, uh, attack. Uh, but in general, I agree, this transparency helps to trace uh, sort of illicit uh, activities. Um, but, you know, in, in, in centralized or in traditional finance, I mean, that has been always the case. I mean, that is why we have all this... Uh, anti-money laundering uh, association, FATA, and also we have all these, you know, like uh, identifications and regulation. For one instance, like HFTs you mentioned, right? HFTs, they are not, you know, beyond the, reg uh, beyond the remit of regulation. They are heavily regulated on what they can do, to what extent they can do. Sometimes they also regulated via self-regulation, by, uh, by regulation imposed by exchanges, for instance. So um, I think, you know, I think we share a lot of common features in terms of uh, how, how things should be designed and how things should be uh, conducted. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of, uh, yeah, and, and talking about, uh, you know, uh, sort of tracing back and recover some of the, uh, some of the uh, funds from the hackers. 
Um, I saw criticism, you know, saying that that is so not DeFi because, you know, uh, like Tether blocking some money of the hackers fund, that is at odds with uh, DeFi's ethos. So I, I, I feel like, you know, to some extent, uh, it's sort of a trade-off. I, I mo mostly see that, you know, DeFi and CeFi and TraFi, they are a menu of options, right? So for people who really believe uh, in decentralization, who really want to have autonomy, maybe pure DeFi serves them well. But, uh, and for people who care about efficiency gains, who care about, you know, easy usage, then maybe CeFi serves them well, right? But I guess, you know, for the majority of the population, we like, you know, somewhere in between that we want a hybrid form uh, of CeFi and DeFi. We may want to have the, you know, technological advantage of these interoperable uh, smart contracts, right? So that really uh, help reduce the, the human cost in reconciling all the procedures in the back offices of banks. Uh, but we would also like to have trusted intermediaries that can take decisions that we can trust. Right, so that there's no that much of backdoor solutions, you know, that we need to, uh, you know, go line by line by code. Actually, I did that when I learned uh, Solidity. So yeah, I, I, I was thinking of uh, contributing to an arbitrage bot, and then when I read some line of the code, it actually just sent my money to an unknown address. You know, it's pure scam. I mean, it's so <laughs> and and I wasted half of my day, you know, investigating the the the, the code. Of course, I'm not a very skillful <laughs> coder myself, but yeah. But just speaking of, you know, for average users, you know, for financial inclusion purposes, uh, when we talk about, you know, for, for the majority of the population, I guess, you know, regulation or centralization and decentralization, they are not necessarily mutually exclusive. I mean, and I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, and just one um, word on the CDFI integration. I think this is an interesting topic, but I also think that by design, the goal should be to build the DeFi underlying primitives in a way that they can be used they can at least be used by those people who really need it and want it in a decentralized manner. But then, to make it accessible to a broader public, it does make a lot of sense to allow those bridges to the external world, to the non-technical people, by allowing some sort of yeah, interface by, by traditional players, by banks or, or like regulated entities that allow you to convert like whatever you, you take out in tokens to fiat or convert them back. So, so you can still kind of benefit from the efficiency gains and from some of the benefits offered by DeFi while still also kind of enjoying the, the extra security or the extra at least confidence that you may put in your bank or your service provider. So I think there is kind of a fruitful um, collaboration or, or, yeah, or possible between CeFi and DeFi. But uh, the base layer, I, I do think that this should be based on a decentralized layer. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. Otherwise, why would you do this in the first place? I mean, centralized is always more efficient than decentralized, and nobody's uh, arguing here. Uh, the problem is that people don't trust centralized anymore. That's the, that's the main problem I see. The main problem for decentralized or DeFi, uh, I would say, we didn't really talk about this yet, is, uh, is this interface to the real world, right? Mm -hmm. Something like uh, oracles, price oracles, and stable coins. I quoted Thomas Jordan before negatively, so let me say something positively as well. <laughs> so he said it exactly correctly, right? So if we're gonna see a bank run, I would fully agree that this comes from a stable coin meltdown and, and, and people wouldn't trust the system anymore. So I think this is something we have to understand. So either we can go and say, you know, the future is anyway decentralized and there's no centralized players anymore and no SMB and BIS and whatnot, right? <laughs> that could happen, we, we don't know. Uh, but if not, we have to have the interface somehow. And, uh, and there maybe something like CBDCs in a DeFi world would be fine or a CB, as you say, a centralized decentralized system would also be fine. Can totally see a hybrid where, like, even when I don't trust um, a traditional uh, financial system, but you know, using a credit card is a much more simple way to interact with reality than uh, taking a hardware wallet and, uh, and doing transactions uh, this way. So, 
maybe maybe I could give some approval that my credit card can use something from from completely decentralized world uh, in quantities not more than something per day and then uh, I don't trust this uh, centralized thing uh, for amount more than this per day. So but I'm kind of reasonably protected from this risk if I care about this risk. No, but technologically this should be very simple, right? Yeah. Uh, Google Pay could just integrate something like uh, USD. Most definitely. And you can be like, I don't know, not well, let's say not 100% of your funds is fully decentralized, but maybe maybe 90% of your funds is uh, non-custodial and 10% is uh, accessible to a custodial entity. So, mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, and different people have different risk appetites and also they judge different risks differently. So, some people may actually pre just trust in code, like trust much more than in, in some player, while other people, yeah, they, they just get more maybe confidence if they have somebody in between. So I think that's something we have to embrace. We cannot just design it for this or the other way. Otherwise, you stay in your bubble. But so you trust yes. fully to keep your password secret <laughs> uh, yourself? Mm? You trust that you trust yourself more than somebody else? Like, oh, yeah. Really? Um, absolutely. <laughs> Because I'm not so sure about it, right? So if I had a lot of, let's say, crypto money, I would kind of get really scared to have somewhere this secret code and what happens if I, you know, die uh, suddenly or... Yeah, well, there, right? there, there are ways to, uh, to deal with that, technological ways, I would yes. say. So, but, yeah, mm, I mean, you, you can't trust somebody to solve it for you, but I don't know. I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, my PhD student lost $500 million, uh, right, uh, when he started his PhD in my group because somebody hacked into his computer and got 10,000 Bitcoins out of it. Wow. So, uh, right. well, you know, uh, if, if, if there was another validator on the side which would have kept a part of the secret, I think it uh, would have been better. There are like uh, social recovery, right? Uh, smart contract wallets that are. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you you can uh, pretty much split trust between multiple people, yeah. and maybe maybe you can choose who you trust. Maybe you can choose multiple financial institutions. Mm -hmm. That that's possible, mm -hmm. and you could um, like, I don't know, could trust several financial institutions in different parts of the globe and distribute your trust this way, mm -hmm. and using using technical means for that. Yeah, no. And also insurance solutions, I mean, right. why not insure the risks of losing your keys in a decentralized way? I mean, that could also be something to explore. Or you, or you can insure your risks uh, in a centralized way. <laughs> yeah. <Bye>. Exactly. <laughs> so I think that is sort of, uh, you know, the bright future that we are facing, right? So because of this technology that opens up a, a door or many doors to potential possibilities. And I think that is a great thing. And I think that's why we sit together and talk to each other about, you know, seeing where we can complement with each other and uh, what we can do together, we can build together, right? So it's... For me, it's really like it's a, it's a it's a range, you know, between DeFi and CFI, and somewhere in between, you know, the the entrepreneurs they are the ones that can fine tune this the tricky balance between how much you want uh, to be uh, centralized and how much you want to be decentralized. I find the term trust very interesting. Right? For me, trust historically always meant that you trust a company because it has been around for a long time and mm. people have nice ties and whatnot. But now we have this technological trust coming to us, right? And this is very much more interesting somehow, right? Because you can really, as you say, you're the master of your domain if you want to be. You can just trust yourself if you want to be, yeah. want to trust yourself only. And I think that's the, that's the really exciting question here. Who, who do you want to trust in the future and why? Well, you also trust that the code is safe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, uh, which, is, which has this property, like if the code was around for a long time, maybe it's time tested. Yes. Just like if the company was around for a long time, maybe you can trust it. Absolutely. I mean, when you go look at the base layer, I would say I now trust Bitcoin because it has been a long time around. And in the beginning, they had problems, right? They had mistakes and bugs and not, not anymore. And uh, age, of course, works there, but... Uh, I guess it's still a bit different from, let's say, the company world where you trust just a company that's been around for 100 years. It's not so clear that they have to run the same code for 100 years, right? They keep changing it. And, uh, uh, yeah, well, I think I that's an it's, it's an interesting concept, like how long has a protocol been around and how much money has been locked in the system? And 
whether this could give you like a trust or risk metric over time. I mean, I think it's not like trivial to derive like what level of trust you would get from it because now, I think there are, there are so many DeFi protocols with like hundreds of millions of funds or even billions of funds that I would say there are not enough security researchers that are probably capable to find bugs in all those systems because there are just too many of them. So even if they hold a lot of funds, so there would be a, a high incentive for hackers to get hold of them, there are maybe not as many sophisticated hackers around mm. to be really on the safe side. I think just the proliferation of... of like yeah, it's pro like the Windows operating system. If you have the biggest operating system, everybody tries to attack you first, right? That's the same in, in the DeFi world, I guess. I think what we're seeing now with all, all the, the, the hacks and scams is uh, DeFi beca becoming safer, right? Uh, because there's so much incentive to break it. Um, and everything is out there in the open for hackers to go and find the loopholes. So they're finding these loopholes, they're attacking these protocols, sometimes they're succeeding, um, but developers are learning from it and are making the system safer. Um, and so an another thing that I, I think we can kind of start to take away is that there, there will definitely be a spectrum for, uh, for the financial system. Uh, between fully decentralized and, and fully centralized. And, and that's a good thing, that people will have the option to be in whatever side of the spectrum they choose. But I think it's important that um, the fully decentralized end of things is allowed to flourish um, and allowed to, to live, and that people can actually uh, have the option of, um, of of using this, uh, this system where the paradigm is different, where you are in control of your own assets and, and you want to trust yourself and the code and not uh, some third party interme intermediary. Uh, because I think that's what's revolutionary here. Um, not, not really kind of the centralized yeah. part of things. Well, maybe can I even think uh, from the perspective of a company who, um, well, financial company versus a company who creates a decentralized system. So a financial for a financial company, holding customers' money or like having access to those is, is actually a liability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it probably would, I, in ideal world, a financial company would probably like to avoid that liability. Maybe, um, maybe they would like to make money, but they probably wouldn't really like to have this liability. And really, DeFi is what uh, would potentially allow that if if done correctly. Sure, but if you know, if that's their business model, that would be sad, right? I mean, I, I think they need to have this trust business model. This needs to be part of it. So yeah, well, I mean, if if it is possible to do something which was done, which was requiring trust before, if it's possible to do that without requirement of trust, maybe that's more attractive for uh, for the business. But, but actually, I think right now, we cannot really say that DeFi is becoming safer or not, because depending on how you measure safetyness, right? So one thing is that indeed, I mean, nowadays more and more um, uh, investigations are going on in DeFi because of the incentives. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, the stake at risk is higher, right? Before we are talking about a few PISA, you know, like big in terms of Bitcoin value. Now we are talking about, you know, like, uh, yeah, tens of thousands of dollars for uh, one Bitcoin, right? So right now, you know, if you are measuring in terms of the potential losses that can incur in the DeFi system, I'm not seeing that DeFi is becoming safer. Although I agree with you that, you know, uh, indeed, now, you know, with more interest in DeFi, more uh, brain powers pouring into DeFi space, this area definitely is becoming more and more interesting. Um, and then the second point is also about, you know, uh, you know, so because, Camilla, you mentioned that, you know, DeFi should be, or decentralization should be allowed to thrive. Um, I, I would like to emphasize one thing, at least from my personal view. Uh, I don't, I never think of regulation is there to, you know, uh, prohibit uh, innovation. I, I, I think all the regulators, you know, or potential regulators uh, um, around the table, I think they all are, you know, holding the, the, the thought that, you know, we are, we are, 
promoting this kind of uh, new technology and see what we can help. Uh, but that being said, I think, you know, um, uh, an Im probably inappropriate analogy that it would be is the, a gun produced by a 3D printer and a gun produced by human, they should be regulated at the same, uh, at the same level in the sense that uh, the effect of the gun is the same, right? So I guess here, when we are talking about financial market, when we are talking about financial activities that can have the same consequence for uh, average uh, public's uh, uh, wealth and their property, uh, I think that we should, uh, you know, exercise the same uh, scrutiny when it comes to uh, DeFi compared to what has been done for tra uh, traditional finance, right? Otherwise, we are creating this unlevel uh, playing field and that would allow for regulatory arbitrage. And speaking of that, I, I truly believe there are some genuine, uh, genuine innovation in DeFi, right? Like Curve, what, what the AMN has been doing or, you know, like uh, uh, collateralized lending, uh, what Robert has been doing. I think these are very, very good applications, very good thought. Um, however, I also feel like, you know, when it gets to trading and lending, you know, exchanges like CME or LCH, they would claim that they are also providing software only, right? So when you think of limit order book, it essentially is a program behind that support all the trading behind the limit order books. However, exchanges and uh, the central counterparties behind this the software, they have been under very, very uh, um, uh, heavy regulation, not because you know we want to stop them from innovating, but because when things go wrong, you can have serious consequence. I mean, look at what Nico Price has been doing, like uh, in early March, right? So it oh. it increases from thirty thousand to hundred thousand. I mean, within two days. Excellent that example on why DeFi is better. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, actually, maybe an example for why, you know, they I would like to ask you a question real quick. So, do you think Facebook stopped their coin uh, research because, because what? Because of regulation, almost surely. So I'm not so sure that uh, regulators only know, have the best of the world. But you know who takes over DM? Silvergate. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, uh, so essentially, I mean, people will find its way to innovate where the proper regulatory clarity has been uh, provided. And actually, I feel like, you know, for this space, uh, yeah, as Camila said, you know, it's sort of a wild west. Uh, and in this kind of environment, actually, you know, better safeguard provided by trusted intermediary that can actually promote this area instead of stifling innovations. But sometimes, I mean, speaking of regulation, I mean, there are good approaches and good initiatives where, at least here in Switzerland, it, for example, there are like regulatory frameworks for some type of tokens which have a real world kind of bridge or they are tokenized assets, so to say. But on the other hand, when it comes to really decentralized systems, we are still in a black hole of regulatory uncertainty, it seems at least to me, because, I mean, it's like a really a different paradigm. It's not just using a new technology to reach the same goal. It's really a different paradigm in and by itself, which kind of escapes regulation in, or it makes it very difficult to even find out who to regulate. I mean, there are many different players and, yeah, who do you regulate? Is it the software developer, whoever deploys the contracts, whoever runs a front end or whoever has governance power or nobody or everybody like i haven't really seen very much clarity on those questions who i mean to if, if they really wanted to regulate right then they could make a color scheme they could say this smart contract we trust and this smart contract we don't trust that's not what's happening no. that that could be a way for regulators to really come into the game and say well, we want to make the system more trustworthy yeah, yeah and instead they're saying you need to kyc every non-custodial wallet yeah. that completely stifles innovation that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like killing DeFi. So, <laughs> right. I guess that goes back to Fabian's point, you know, like, uh, yeah, we need to fix sort of the language about what is DeFi and what essentially DeFi can provide, right? So when it gets to KYC and AML, uh, for me, I personally think that they are just another layer uh, in terms of uh, ensuring proper governance, ensuring that, you know, people... I, I, I don't understand why, you know, uh, but, but I think actually, Camila, you 
pointed out that you know this the uh, digital identity could potentially help you know DeFi, right? So, but I think I think that's what. That's what uh, regulators and, and I think participants in general should be thinking about how to use this technology to help uh, make this space safer. Not existing regulations, because uh, implementing KYC in the same way that's done with traditional finance and the trying to shove it into DeFi, uh, where, you know, a, like decentralized exchanges simply cannot perform that function. Um, so it, it, it's, not, it's not as easy as saying you regulate a gun maker in the same way, because one, one thing is a gun and the, and the next thing is something completely different, even if they're both used for the same thing. So you cannot regulate it in the same way. You can't expect DEXs to do KYC because they don't have the information for, for their customers. So I think, or for their users, I should say. So I think that's where the emphasis should be placed. It's how do we use this technology to, to you know, in, 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 in its native way and, and not trying to kind of fit this kind of uh, square in a round hole, of, of, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, you I, I guess it's better yeah. even not to start with technology. I guess it's, it's better to start with demand. Like, um, what are the risks? How do we make these, list, uh, these risks smaller for the users? And actually, that's, that does happen. Uh, this self-regulation does happen in, uh, in DeFi. For example, uh, there, is, uh, there, was a, there is a group of, um, of uh, users in, in Curve who have time to, to research um, different protocols. And actually, in Curve, uh, you, anybody can deploy a pool, but uh, to, for that pool to get, uh, to get incentives from the protocol, its governance needs to vote for that. So what, ha what would happen if uh, the stable coin in that pool just claims to be a stable coin, but actually is uh, backed by nothing and at some point will become zero. So, and uh, like, um, would every, everyone who votes for that pool uh, research, do they have time for that? And really they don't. So uh, uh, that's why there is uh, this group of users uh, who kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, proposed to, uh, to do this exactly this sort of research about every proposal coming in. And they, uh, they pretty much uh, report, uh, well, they write quite, quite good reports. Like where if, if this project is, is it fully decentralized? Is, is there trust to anyone involved? What can, uh, what can that privileged account do? And so on and so on. And then um, they have a kind of brief summary, like, you know, this is, um, safe to vote for, this is why, or this is not safe. Uh, they, uh, they are not enforcing anything, but they are informing anyone, informing voters, in, in, informing users who want to deposit to, to that particular pool and so And it comes so from on. the community itself. Nobody comes told the them community. to do them. No, there yeah. was nobody Ex forcing them. Exactly. exactly. I find that is exactly what we are talking about when it comes to regulation, right? When it comes to actually providing public good. In this case, it is really, you know, a group of people, a part of the community that, you know, providing this public good. And then in the public sector, I think we are also here, you know, just to, to help. That's why we have the conference to learn more about you guys and then to learn more about what can be done and uh, what kind of public goods would be needed in this field in the sense of, uh, you know, providing a safer and more efficient financial system, right? Great. Um, okay, I think we need to be wrapping up. Uh, I think to, to end on kind of a forward-looking statement, I'd love to just uh, hear uh, just briefly about, you know, how, how DeFi and um, how a future kind of DeFi and CBDCs uh, looks like. Like, if, I don't know, 10 years from now when this all, all has been solved, <laughs> how, how do you think that looks like? I think one interesting um, future outcome could be like this notion of financial completeness where everything that's imaginable has a price tag. I mean, that's just one extreme like which can happen when, when you can kind of encode all the like options or kind of uncertain events you, you have like a price for and you can 
like completely efficiently uh, represent them in one way or another and also ensure against every risk that you can think of, like that could be like, like very far in the future, maybe not even 10 years, but more than that, mm -hmm. which could be enabled by this technology. Yeah, well, maybe not, not so distant, but I can imagine that um, if if DeFi interacts with with CBDCs, it would be like the ult uh, the ultimate way to interact uh, with the reality. So it's the ultimate bridge between real world and virtual world. And uh, I mean, uh, whatever makes sense to to keep in virtual world can can live there. And uh, CBDCs are the ways to uh, to actually. Uh, uh, to, for humans to use it. For me, you know, in 10 years, I would imagine that, you know, we will still uh, gather together for the 10th uh, DeFi conference organized by SMB and BIS, uh, but maybe in the metaverse, you know, like uh, not in Zurich, and that uh, we can welcome all the, all the viewers. Um, but but uh, so the technology, I think, would be very, very different from, um, from uh, today's world. Uh, but the fundamental principle, you know, like, um, like what Augustine mentioned, sustainability, uh, save, all these fundamental value for financial markets, I think they will still be uphold in 10 years. I think the two can go together very well, uh, DeFi and CBDC. Uh, and I disagree, let's say, that's the only thing I disagree with Fabio and Cher's talk. Uh, I liked all the rest of it, but I think, you know, just because one is a D and one is a C, they're different. I think, you know, you can change things a little bit and mold things a little bit. And what you said, uh, that if you bring CBDCs uh, stable, instead of stable coins into the, on the platform, I think it would greatly uh, make things uh, safer, much more than more regulation even. True, true. So maybe more CBDCs, less regulation. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, decentralized CBDCs. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it was such an interesting panel. I actually didn't follow any of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a spontaneous, good yeah, discussion. It was great. Thanks so much. Thanks.